Let me. Are you recording, Jeff? I just started. You need me to pause it? No, no, that's fine. I just want to make sure. Okay, so I will go ahead and start with this. I was hoping David would be on, but uh, this is a follow-up of a case I showed a few months ago, but he'll get to see it eventually. This is a patient who uh, you may remember from I don't know, a couple months ago now, but it was a patient that had this soft tissue, and it's encasing the aorta, it's encasing the pulmonary artery, there's some mass effect, it's in the pericardium, you can see it's in the recesses, in the pericardium, it's encasing, but not really compressing the coronary arteries, and same thing with this big soft tissue mass that's along the internal mammary vessels and extending outside the, or into the chest wall. So this was biopsy, they did an open surgical biopsy of this mass in three different places. And at the time, all they got was fibroinflammatory tissue and the discussion, and I think we were all in agreement that this was probably going to end up being you know, some sort of lymphoma or cancer really until proven otherwise, and they needed more tissue because I don't think anybody was really happy with that diagnosis. And the possibility of like of Hodgkin's lymphoma was raised just because sometimes it can be really hard to see the Reed Sternberg cells and the lymphoma that you may get some sort of fibrotic reaction. But anyway, they went in and took out this whole thing. So not just an open surgical biopsy, but excised this thing completely. And we do have an answer now. So anybody want to take a guess? Uh, let's have a look. It's an inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor. That was kind of, that was what was, something like that was said the first time, right? This fibroinflammatory nodule. Right. And then there was, this is just the original pathology. And then they were saying something about like some weird variant of sclerosing mediastinitis, which you know, Jeff being the one that sees the most fibrosing mediastinitis of, of any of us probably you know, would not think that. But it did turn out to be something more than just that. And it, it actually turned out to be extranodal Rosei Dorfman disease. And why didn't it didn't save in this report? Well, anyway, they they should have been in one of these. I guess it didn't save it. But yeah, this was all extranodal Rosei Dorfman. So of course that's a a non-Langerhans histiocytic or sinus histiocytosis. And while it's reported benign, I think a lot of the cases are reported in kids where there's spontaneous regression when you have cervical lymphadenopathy. Uh, I, we'll see what happens with this guy. He's being referred to Hemonc to see what they want to do. Because sometimes they'll treat this with radiation or with, I don't even know if they have some chemotherapeutic agents or just steroids that they can use. But we do have an answer that it's more than just uh, some sort of just benign fibroinflammatory process. They stained it for IgG4. It was not IgG4 positive. Uh, I was able to find two cases of, of cardiac or pericardial involvement, just isolated case reports from Rosei Dorfman, but nothing this extensive. But it, we were, you know, along the correct lines when we said this was something other than just, you know, a fibroinflammatory response. Wow. So. That is dramatic. Yep. So we have an answer, though, of, of Rosei Dorfman. Now, this is a pretty dramatic case. And I want to make sure that I can load the correct study first. Travis, I came in late. Did you say that oh. was that was Rosei Dorfman there? Yeah. Hi, David. Yep. This was Rosei Dorfman because I yeah I was saying that we this is the one we showed a, that I showed a couple months ago, and we were all in a, in fair agreement that this wasn't just going to be some fibroinflammatory process. That this was going to be something else, and it turned they excised this entire right internal mammary mass this time and we're able to make a diagnosis of Rosei Dorfman. Wow. And he hasn't seen hematology yet, so we're not sure exactly what they'll do to treat it, but they will, you know, I'll let you know when, when we figure it out. Cool. All right, so this one, quite the dr dramatic case. This is 2012. This lady is in her 30s or 40s, I think, and you can see she's uh, not small to begin with here, has a lot of soft tissue anteriorly. But you'll notice one thing that's missing is her sternum. She's had several surgeries. The most recent had been, I think, in like 2008, but at, before this CT. So she had a, a sternectomy as a result of mediastinitis complicating one of her surgeries as a kid. You can see that she's had a stent in her pulmonary artery. So I, th I think she's, I think she, I'm pretty sure she's a TET variant of sorts. But she has a prosthetic aortic valve. She's got a VSD patch here. 
And she had part of her ascending aorta reconstructed here. And so this is 2012. And she came in a couple of weeks ago at the beginning of December and was having new chest pain. And I'll show you, let's see, this radiograph relative to July, you know, she's got a, a, a right-sided arch and you know doesn't really look that much different. She's just got distorted anatomy. Now, they did this, it's kind of, it's kind of funny because they did a rib and sternal series because she was having pain. And I'm trying to see if I can find, if there was, there's a lateral, oh, here's the sternum. And, you know, not really that useful in her, except, and, you know, we didn't read that, but, you know, looks like there might be something here, almost looks like a breast implant, but only show you that because I know what the answer is on the CT, but wait till you see the CT here. And this was her now, and her chest, her, her anterior chest is now palp, uh, is pulsatile. And this is what's happened in the last, apparently this just arose in the last few weeks that she had this enormous pseudoaneurysm arising from her ascending aorta. So nothing in terms of surgery sent in the last 10 years or so, but I think at least my thought is that this is a felt pledge that when you compare to the other study you'll see is has been displaced. I think this is the felt pledge that used to be right here and is now displaced rightward. And so this is clearly the the site of where this humongous pseudoaneurysm has developed. And it's, you know, I don't know if it's grown anything yet or not. They were not excited about taking her to the operating room to resect this surgically. So instead they did a they they did an interventional, at least temporizing measure on this thing. And so you'll see this is the the initial angiogram, and you can see this thing filling with contrast. But what they first did was put a stent over the this the the, the site of communication here, and you'll see in this series just trying to scroll through it fast, but you'll see in the floral where they actually just deploy a fairly short segment stent in her ascending aorta. But what's more interesting than that is, is what they did afterwards, which was put a bunch of coils in this thing. Now, one of the coils broke off and is in the ascending aorta, a little coil fragment. You can see these are just trying to incite it to thrombose, but they're even mobile to some degree. And I guess one of the questions is, will, you know, what are they gonna do in terms of antibiotics? Since this is presumably an infection that caused this pseudoaneurysm but I just thought it was kind of cool that they were deploying these coils and that they're just flopping around in this thing. But um, she's doing well, it hasn't ruptured, but we'll see, maybe they'll have to do surgery eventually on that. Hmm. But wow. yeah, but pretty, so they deployed pretty the coil, Sorry, they deployed the coils by threading um, a delivery catheter on the outside yes. of the stent? Right, so they, yeah, good question. So they have on this one, let's see one of these series, uh, the stent's already been deployed. They had, put a, they had put a catheter outside of the stent before they deployed it. So this catheter, right. they deployed the stent and then this second catheter was already outside of it. And this is the one where they're deploying the coils into okay. that. So yeah, okay. so they, they maintained access into the pseudoaneurysm neck and then they deployed the stent in the ascending aorta. Wow, so. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so pretty exciting. Yeah, and that's let's see. And then this one, you guys, hopefully you will find this one to be interesting. This is a, a congenital case. And this is like a, a lot of newborns. This is one of the reasons I like CT better than MR, as I'll show you in a second. But this is a, a baby who was prenatally diagnosed with what they thought was a just a large ductus arteriosus. And I will show you, that's alluding to the fact that it's not necessarily what this turns out to be. But at, at birth, they had a nuchal cord and had re required resuscitation. And then on a brain MR, they, had, they noticed that they had several embolic strokes and they wanted to take a look at the chest as well. And so this is the MR we got. And there was this weird looking communication here. This is a, just an uh, axial cine stack at pulmonary artery anteriorly. So off the pulmonary trunk, because this is the right pulmonary artery back here, there's this weird thing that kind of looked like it was communicating to the aorta. 
And if you follow this vessel up, this actually turns out to be the left common carotid artery. And then there's the left internal jugular vein. And she had a, a left-sided superior vena cava as well. So there's bilateral superior vena cava. And then on this, this axial black blood from, let's see, this is the one, no, not from, this one from the brain was actually a better study because the patient wasn't really sedated very well for the cardiac MR. But you can again see the structure in here. It looks like it's a, the left common carotid artery is arising from the pulmonary artery and not from the ascending aorta as well. So we were curious about the origin of that, got them to do a CT. And you will see that, in fact, this patient has a left common carotid artery that arises anomalously from the, ascend, from the, the pulmonary artery anteriorly right here, never communicates with the, carot the, the right aortic arch at all. And there's an aberrant left subclavian that does come off of the aorta. But this is anomalous origin of the left carotid artery from the pulmonary artery. And there have been case reports of this. I've never seen it before, but it explains why the patient, I think why the patient had several embolic appearing strokes. This is the ADC map, and you'll see that in their brain that they have several bilateral foci of what they thought were embolic strokes. And so, of course, you know, this could be a dynamic or, or bidirectional shunt. And you know, so this was one of the reasons that we wanted to do the, the CT early or, or quickly soon after the MR, just because of the potential. If you have an increased pressure in the pulmonary side, then it will result in a, in a right to left shunt and probably was the source of the emboli. Now, on this study, we, there's air in the pulmonary artery in the, aort, in the right atrium, admittedly, you know, from improper flushing of, of the catheter or from one of their IVs. But Unfortunately, we don't think the baby had any more strokes after this study. So, David and Jeff specifically, have you guys seen this variant before? This is the first time I've seen it. I've never seen it. I wonder if it's a variant of truncus or something. I'm trying to think embryologically how you would get the carotid off the yeah. pulmonary artery short of some sort of hemitruncus I, or something. Yeah, I... I saw, I found one case report and it was nearly identical to this in the sense that it was a right arch with an aberrant left subclavian artery, a left ductus. I think this is the ductal remnant here. And then the, the anomalous origin of the left carotid from the pulmonary artery. Uh, yeah, so it was a nearly identical morphology. I'll look and see, because I didn't get a chance to, to read on it, but I was, there was only one case report I found of it. But it makes sense. I think that we haven't reviewed the echo yet, the prenatal echo, but I bet what they were seeing with the to and fro flow, what they thought was a PDA was probably this vessel. And there was a, you know, there would have been a small ductus here as well, but I bet it was the carotid artery, which, because they thought it was a large PDA. So. Wow. I will, I will stop there. I do have more if time permits at the end. Okay. All right. David or Howard? Who wants to go next? I need a little time. I can go if you want. Okay. All right. I came across this case recently overhearing a conversation between a pulmonology person and a colleague and overhearing it, it sounded very interesting. A patient has had for quite a long time hemoptysis and on multiple occasions, they've done bronchoscopy. This is one from August of 2017 and the person has had maybe one or two even before that. And you can see what is being described here in relation to the distal trachea and left main bronchus. So they are dilated submucosal vessels. They are dilated, it's quite plethoric, with no endobronchial lesions. I'll show you images from the most recent bronchoscopy done in November. And this shows that to great advantage. So almost anywhere you look, you'll see dilated submucosal vessels. And they are particularly numerous in the left main bronchus. 
So, of course, they are being blamed for the episodes of hemoptysis. Presumably, they rupture sometimes and bleed and are responsible for it. So that was very intriguing. So then I went back and looked at the CT, the CTs that have been done. And I'll show you one from March of last year. And a relevant finding was not picked up on this one. That explains very nicely why we have those bronchial findings. So the finding is thrombotic occlusion of left superior and left inferior pulmonary veins. They are completely out. And yes, this patient has had multiple episodes of radiofrequency abrasion of veins for atrial fibrillation. In fact, I could see a little bit of a wasting phenomenon right here involving this one too. So how to connect up the occluded pulmonary veins with bronchial findings. I find a bunch of articles about that. Um, here's a really nice one. There are two that are really nice. One I'll show you here is just a really nice imaging study, an anatomic study actually from my medical school. It's kind of interesting because I remember that guy. Those guys were great anatomists and they taught us anatomy or they gave us lectures in anatomy. So this guy in the Department of Thoracic Surgery did the study with his colleagues on the bronchial circulation and they used all kinds of stuff that they injected into it and they mapped out the bronchial circulation. But basically what they described in terms of the bronchial veins and they described a set of deep or true bronchial veins from the lung and as well as pleurohyla veins as well are the presence of lots of communications in different places between bronchial veins and pulmonary veins. And certainly with respect to the pleurohyla veins, we've seen that before in cases of central venous obstruction where there is flow of blood from the veins, systemic veins to the pulmonary veins and the left atrium. But in this case, because those veins are out, it's the opposite problem, too much pressure and shunting of blood into the bronchial veins that are responsible for that. And then Jeff was kind enough to find this article for me. Um, I saw it, but I didn't have access to before 1980. Nine, I think, and this is a really nice paper from 1988 in chest describing endobronchial changes. And here, you, I'll show you, I haven't had a chance to read this, but you can see they've described very nicely in cases of pulmonary venous hypertension, these dilated submucosal vessels in the bronchial tree, just like what we have here. So of course, back then, they wouldn't have thought of of pulmonary vein stenosis from ablation as an etiology, but you can see the title there, Endobronchial Changes in Chronic Pulmonary Venous Hypertension. So I don't think I've ever seen a case of that before, or perhaps I've missed it in patients with, with venous occlusions and hemoptysis, thinking about the bronchial, submucosal bronchial vessels. So I'm not sure what they're going to do for this person. He also has a watchman device in right now for in his left atrial appendage, which is not going to help too much. So Howard, it kind of reminds me of cases of fibrosing mediastinitis, where you get the engorged veins in the um, airway walls, and you know often the veins are the first thing to go uh, with fibrosing mediastinitis. So. I guess it's a similar phenomenon, but I've never seen um, um, the, uh, the hemoptysis from it. Yep, yep, that would make sense. I didn't think of that right off, but really put this together belatedly very nicely we did, ultimately. Wow, that's very impressive. You know, we had that case of uh, sarcoid with um, pulmonary vein occlusions and um i wonder if there was a similar hyperemia i'll go back and see if there was a bronch on that on that person to see if they also saw the vascular engorgement here yeah i certainly think about it going forward i wish i'd known about this this entity years and years ago because now i wonder 
about this as a cause of hemoptysis in, in conditions in which pulmonary veins can be affected and occluded and pulmonary vein hypertension. Really looks like, um, you know, um, it looks as if you're looking at somebody's retina out here and their bloodshot eyes. So this is yeah. blood breaking out here. Yeah. Pretty dramatic, huh? All right, let me show you another one. Let's see this one is. Okay, this one is a presumptive diagnosis, but given the appearance, it's a very strong presumptive diagnosis. So the background here is a person with rather severe systemic mastocytosis. She has some bone findings. She has intermittent episodes of, um, they have like an urticarial or hypersensitivity reaction from um, the mast cells. So let me just bring up, say, the non-thin cuts just to show you the osseous findings in the spine. Uh, very typical of what we see with, may see with systemic mastocytosis when there are lots of mast cells in the bone marrow of the spine particularly. But I want to show you the lungs and if we look at the lungs, these are thin cuts. They were definitely very abnormal. And it's a bit hard to describe this. It's basically a combination of diffuse pulmonary hyperattenuation, probably from very small accumulation of cells, basically. So we have central lobular nodules or confluent nodules to make ground glass opacities. But there's also a reticulation to it. And then let me put these thin cuts and make a minimum for you and not too thick to show you that there are also some places where there are some small cysts that have developed. So as I scroll around, let me see if I can find one here and not too many, but as I scrolled around, I could find small cystic spaces. Let me go up here. I can't remember where I saw them, but they were subtle and small. So the combination of reticulation or ground glass opacity and small cystic spaces has certainly been described in lung involvement with systemic mastocytosis. And if you biopsy the lung, when you get tissue, you'll get basically mast cells. So here one is one, for example, from um, the guys of Michigan in the JTI. And you can see very similar findings on their exam of a diffuse pulmonary parenchymal abnormality, very much like what I'm showing you here. Mm. So I think definitely lung involvement in this person with systemic mastocytosis. So and histo histologically, what is in the in the lung? Is it mast cells or is it? It's mast cells. Yeah. It's mast cells in the lungs and basically just a large number of mast cells in the lungs. And do these do these patients end up with extra medullary hematopoiesis as well? I or not? Does don't it don't know about that? Because I, I was wondering because with the bones, I don't know how much of the marrow gets replaced. Because I was thinking maybe some of that could be pulmonary extra medullary hematopoiesis, as we've shown with myelofibrosis and other marrow yeah, replacing me, diseases. We can see I think that the case reports that I've found do not mention that as such, that that is an issue as such. Uh, this person's on a clinical trial because some of these are associated with an abnormality of what's called a KIT gene, that is systemic mastocytosis, and they're treating her with this investigation or drug that as an inhibitor of this thing called activated kit, but I don't know anything else about that. So I'm not sure, Travis, whether you can also get extramedullary hematopoiesis as well. But certainly the case reports where you do sample it, um, you do find mast cells there. So let's have a look what they found here. Interesting. This one described which biopsies demonstrating increased mast cells and septal fibrosis. 
so and has demonstrated basophilic mast cells as well. And okay. I can also see small cystic spaces. I'm not quite sure why they, they might be there. So I think definitely a case of pulmonary mastocytosis in that patient too. Let's see. So, Howard, it was not a yes. cigarette smoker, right? We don't have other reasons to have holes in the lung. Not that I know of. I don't think she's, no, she's not a cigarette smoker. Let's go back and see the history. She's 36 year old. She's had it for quite a long time, since 2013. She's had the cutaneous manifestations since 2009. Bone marrow biopsy showed mast cells. Not a cool. smoker, no. Thank you. Very interesting. Yeah. Cool. This is something that um, is kind of cute. So this is a person uh, with a disorder, and I will tell you that Let's make sure that the wrong person here. She's got a bone lesion and she put up for this bone lesion for quite some time now. So the bone lesion that I'm going to show you here is not a new thing. And it is thought to be a benign lesion, um, a fibrous dysplasia type of lesion. But she's been followed periodically for that with surveillance imaging at the sarcoma clinic, but she doesn't have a sarcoma, but it's a bone lesion. So the most recent exam, and you'll see how the lungs look okay back here in 2017, but the most recent follow-up, or close to it, showed new large rounded opacities in the lungs on chest radiography. And if you look in addition to that and look at the hyla regions, you'll wonder whether she also has lymph node enlargement too. So new pulmonary parenchymal disease and lymph node enlargement. And I'll show you what these guys look like. So she does have lymph node enlargement. And here are what the lung lesions look like. So they are multifocal, multilobar. They don't have sharp interfaces with adjacent lung in many locations. Airways and vessels traverse the lesions without a problem. And there is the lymph node enlargement, which is quite extensive. So any quick diagnosis for unanticipated large lesions like this, patent airways, incidental finding, asymptomatic. Well, it could be sarcoid. Um, there's something going on with the mm -hmm. left main bronchus too. I'm not sure if there's just debris uh, in there or if it's actually soft tissue extending. Little disc yeah. right there, there's a little, I don't know if it's yeah. secretions. I like yeah. sarcoid for the yeah. lytic yeah. bone lesions. Yeah, sarcoid or lymphoma. Although I expect her to be symptomatic from lymphoma. Yep, yeah. not symptomatic, this was a surprise. Yeah, you're right about that left main bronchus. I'm not quite sure what's in there exactly, if it's secretions or something in there in addition. But there is the symmetric and quite extensive lymph node enlargement. Jeff, you're exactly right. Here's the guided lung biopsy. Lots of non-necrotizing granulomas. So really nice case of that. Incidental, unexpected diagnosis of parenchymal and modular sarcoidosis. So unrelated to the fibrous dysplasia then? Right. Unrelated. Unrelated. Yep. Just appeared. Wow. Yeah. I was trying to figure out if there was a sarcoid galaxy type sign, if there were little nodules, discrete nodules in the periphery of some of these, and they may well be little. I think there are right there. Yeah. And you see some in the superior segment on the left, up a few slices. You can see yeah. the fuzzy nodules right, right around in the there. Periphery, there could be little nodules there, which would make the sarcoid galaxy sign. But otherwise, finding is very consistent with sarcoid. I have no trouble with that diagnosis. Yeah. Even before the biopsy. Yeah. So I used to see a fair amount of this uh, so called alveolar sarcoid when I was at Duke in the South. And it seems to, I think it goes partly with uh, the black population there and stuff like that. So um, do you know what color skin she had, this, this lady? 
I don't know, David. Yeah, and the thing is that, you know, despite the dramatic radiology, just as in this case, uh, this tends to be relatively sparse on symptoms. You know, it's dramatic radiographically, but not that yeah. symptom. Yeah. Yeah, David, that's been my experience too. Um, in the black population getting the large mass like stuff and getting the more diffuse um, perilymphatic nodules in the Scandinavian, Northern European population. <clears throat> so one of the transcriptionists there at, uh, at Duke had this pattern of sarcoid. She was a young black woman and she, um, she said that her doctors insisted that she continue to smoke cigarettes because it would help protect her against her sarcoid. So <laughs> therapeutic smoking. It pre helps prevent it, but once you have it, it doesn't really do much good. Okay, Jeff, those are mine for this week. All right. Thanks, Howard. David, are you ready yet? I think I'm ready. All righty. So our first case is a rentgenogram. It's a, a, a bedside radiograph here. And, you know, you can forgive the slight differences in tissue density on the two sides just because it's you know, the vagaries of portable radiolo radiology. But then if you look at the axillary fold here, it's really very different on the two sides. So you can't follow the arm up to the armpit on the left, but you definitely can follow the arm all the way on this side, on the right. And um, this person has uh, Poland syndrome here with just no pectoral muscle whatsoever on the right. And, um, you know, normal pectoral muscle on the left. So Jonathan Revels, our fellow, uh, has been really uh, 3Ding up a storm. And so this is his uh, reconstruction of the skin surface of this person. I'm very grateful to him. And you can see very nicely that uh, difference here in the, in the axillary fold. Normally, you know, tissue from the arm will fold onto the, onto the thorax down here and fill in the space. But if you have Poland syndrome and you don't have a pectoral muscle, then you can follow this, this cleft here between arm and chest wall all the way up deep into the armpit. And there are some more, uh, there's some more 3D sections here too. I think there's some other, others that he generated for, yes, yeah, let's, let's look at this one. So here's, here he just isolated the, the muscles. He gave him this um, cyanotic color. So it'd be nicer to have red muscles, but I'll take what I can get. So I think these 3D reconstructions are really dramatic. There's just no pectoral muscle here on the right and normal pectoral muscle on the left. So Poland syndrome illuminated here with color and 3D. Very nice. And then um, here's a guy who had this um, um, initially pretty clear radiograph. I mean, he's he is subject to aspiration. He does have some basal crud that has varied. At this point, he's got some atelectasis in that left lung base. And uh, somewhat later, um, he has a little bit more stuff in the in the bases. At this point, he was symptomatic. He was, um, you can see his lateral view shows quite a bit of stuff in the lower lobe. And he was treated for aspiration. One of the agents he got was Augmentin. And his radiograph um, got more dramatic. Things got worse down there despite treatment. And here's what CT looked like um, around this time. So. Um, he had an earlier CT when he first presented, and it showed basal stuff in this distribution, posterior basal stuff that fit very nicely for aspiration. But on this CT scan, about a week or 10 days into his course, these uh, peripheral fluffy consolidation thingies have progressed out of the aspiration zone, and they're uh, at periphery and multiple other parts of the lung. So he was, he got bronchoscopy, and he had a, um, he had a large number of eosinophils, I think thousands of eosinophils per uh, microliter on his bronch. And he also had, had by, had by this time, had a 30% eosinophilia uh, in his peripheral blood. So um, this is actually eosinophilic pneumonia in this fellow. And he probably initially started with aspiration, pretty much for sure, and based on his former history. but. I think because of the augmentin, he then got a, um, a new of pneumonia. And the team unearthed a report about augmentin, which is ampicillin 
combined with, I think it's clavulinic acid or something like that, uh, which prolongs the effect of, of the ampicillin, makes it um, makes some organisms susceptible that would ordinarily be resistant to ampicillin. That is a, is, is a known cause then of eosinophilic pneumonia. So initially it looked like aspiration because the peripheral stuff was confined, confined to the dependent areas of the lower lobes. But then as the, as the eosinophilic pneumonia got worse, it extended elsewhere. So I don't know how much the original stuff is aspiration, and how much might have been an eosinophilic pneumonia starting out. That part's a little uncertain. So eosinophilic pneumonia. And then, um, <clears throat> um, let's see, is this the same guy now, or is this? Yeah. Um, this is a woman who had initially pretty clear chest radiograph. She's uh, 77 years old. Uh, her right base looked okay at this point, and I'll show you some later radiographs on her. Um, at this point, um, she now had some symptoms of pneumonia and had this consolidation down here in the in the lung base. She'd had an earlier CT scan um, before this episode of uh, pneumonia, and let me show you what that looked like. So at this point, her bronchi are nice and patent going into uh, lower lobes here. So the bronchi look pretty normal here. And then uh, at the time that she it has more consolidation and more symptoms, which brings us to, let's try this one, see if it's here at this point. At this point, there seems to be a little bit of a bulge here, a little bit of narrowing of the airway at this point. And you can see there's, um, there's kind of a blob here and uh, got this mucus impaction of the distal bronchi down here. So she was bronchoscoped around this time, and they thought they were, they encountered, the bronchoscopist encountered a hard mass that he thought was a broncholith, but the woman doesn't have a history of living in the Midwest to get histoplasmosis to create a broncholith, but there was a hard uh, mass-like thing that they encountered there. And Ultimately, she had a dense consolidation in this lower lobe because this, um, what was mucus plugging, pre progressed to complete obstruction and collapse of that lower lobe. The, our surgeon uh, went in and was unable to get a bronchoscope past this lesion and ultimately did a sleeve resection. He took out the lower lobe but preserved the middle lobe. He moved the middle lobe bronchus uh, a little more proximally. And this turns out to be an endobronchial. Uh, uh, hamartoma uh, pathologically. So there were no malignant elements to it, despite the fact that a CT scan about a year before didn't show much. And then there was, you know, this was must have been fairly fast growing, despite the fact that it's uh, turned out to be a benign lesion. So no malignancy, no signs that it was an inflammatory lesion. It was thought when they encountered cartilage on, on initial biopsy that it might have been aspirated, say, pork bone or something like that. But they found that it was actually uh, it was viable cartilage, so it wasn't uh, dead cartilage that somebody aspirated in uh, by eating you know pork bones or something like that. But it was actually um, it was um, it was part of a hamartoma. So endobronchial hamartoma here is the cause of lower lobe collapse. Okay. That's, wow. Develop that, develop that as an older person. As an older person, and, and rapidly, I, I, I combed through that earlier CT scan, and there just wasn't any hint of mass at all uh, in this location. So that that had me spooked. I, I had all sorts of other explanations for this. I thought aspirated foreign bodies, body and inflammation, and maybe this is just inflammatory tissue around here. But um, the inflammation was all distal, and uh, the lesion itself was not was not inflamed. So came out of nowhere and yet it was benign. So wow. very curious. Huh. Yeah. Maybe the different tissues in it grow at different rates. Could be. Okay, well I had another case, but um it's not quite ready to show. It wasn't uh wasn't performing well for me, so I'll save that. Okay. All righty here. Let's see. All righty. 
So Julie sent me two cases. I'll start with hers. Um, nice examples. Uh, so this first case is a patient with um, hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, and uh, well, so there's the one of the lesions that have been treated, and there's another one in the liver. And um, she didn't give me the full story, but my guess is they probably presented with some back pain and maybe some uh, neurologic symptoms because there's this mass centered on the spine, and you can see extension into the, the uh, spinal canal. And um, we've got that. And then there's another large lesion involving the 10th rib on the right. Uh, where we got it here, if I can count. There we go. So an expand solidic lesion. So this is just metastatic HCC. We don't see much anymore because so many of these patients are screened with MR that they catch them early. Um, but I think uh, one of the teaching points, you know, the ones I have seen, it tends to behave like renal cell. It tends to be hypervascular. It likes bone. And when I've seen it in the lungs, I've seen cases of endovascular metastases. So a, a renal cell. Um, and then this is, you can, this is a nice uh, old lateral there. And I'm going to guess that the new lateral shows, uh, yeah, we'd see a new interface there on the frontal. Let's see, where's the old frontal? There we go. Yep. That's yeah. A nice PA radiograph. Yeah, yeah. There you go. So there's the old one about a year earlier. And here's the new one with the new interface. I was trying to get the lateral to see if you can see the, there it is right yep. there. Harder to see the destructive component. And then going back, we should be able to see that left 10th rib lesion. Maybe let's see. Um, well, maybe too far out there, but, um, that is the right one. So that's HCC. And then she sent me this really interesting mesothelioma. Uh, and it's interesting in that they had a hard time getting a diagnosis. So this is a, I don't know how old, but I'm guessing older patient who had these pleural effusions. And you can see they've got funny contours already to me that suggest loculation. And of course, older patients, you have to start thinking about um, malignancy. And there's some soft tissue component to it in some areas. And then we see a lot of stuck down lung. And then as we go down further, we just see these large effusions and, and some maybe some thickening in the diaphragm, but hard to say much about that. Uh, a lot, very clearly lost a lot of weight. There's very little subcutaneous fat. Um, they tried to do a VATS, but they couldn't get into the pleural space because everything was so stuck. Um, this is a PET scan. And these are the fused images. And what's kind of cool is you see this just diffuse uptake along the diaphragm. So I'm presuming that is going to be the pleural surface on the diaphragm and, and in the intercostal muscle. So this is a bilateral mesothelioma. Hmm. Uh, so what they ended up doing, and you can see there's that area of soft tissue. They end up biopsying the chest wall, and that confirms the diagnosis, which is what you need to do to prove uh, chest wall or some other invasion other than just mesothelial cells, which you'll get if you just do a thoracentesis. I looked for pleural plaque. I didn't see any. So um, the presumption is there's still asbestos exposure. All right. This is a case I just ran into yesterday. Um, and I this is a um, middle-aged guy with a history of pancreatitis and sepsis. And uh, one of our interventionalists just happened to ask me about something totally unrelated. And you'll see uh, on this non-contrast abdomen CT, uh, there's a bunch of, there's a fusion, a bunch of stuff going on in the belly. And that's not why I'm showing this case. But what I want to do is now show a CT from five days later. There we go. And I want you to look at the heart. And you'll notice the left, the interventricular septum is getting denser. Kind of all, and then the lateral free wall. So the left ventricular myocardium is now getting denser. So that is five days later. And then here's a, another CT that was performed yesterday. And now you can see wow. this calcification in there. And I think initially the, someone uh, thought maybe this was retained contrast or something, but um, I think this is what, you know, the, the calcification that can occur rapidly, the heart of stone that I know yep. um, we've seen on this conference before in the setting of, in this case, sepsis. Uh, it's been reported in acute renal failure but I think this is too dense to be contrast here. I think that's all calcium. And um, the couple of case reports that are out there suggest that most times the myocardium is pretty normal. Um, but I, I don't know what one would do with this. But and, don't you agree? Uh, oh, yeah. This is yes. what we've probably seen five cases of this now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Even yeah, because the sepsis 
the sepsis damages the myocardium. Did, did the patient have have uh, transient renal insufficiency as well, or uh, I don't, I, I don't, I'm not privy to that information. Okay. But I'm, my guess is almost certainly. Yeah. But, but guys, are you attributing this to um, to some toxin in this in the sepsis, or is it hypotension that goes with the sepsis? I think it's a myocardial injury. But it's yeah. Not, it's not infarction from hypotension. That's not what we're invoking here. No, it's not. It's because it's the whole left ventricle. It's not even a, a vascular territory. It's, it's some sort of metabolic thing. Mm -hmm. It's pretty cool. I, I wonder yeah. what the mechanism is. Um, so it'd be nice to know. Was there was there renal failure? Was there transient renal? I'm uh, I'm almost positive this was a pretty sick patient with. Um, sepsis and I, i'm almost positive yeah it was done at a, a different it's from a it was at a different hospital so i don't have access to that information and uh and you're saying that the myocardium can still function despite this right there's uh, an old case report in in jack that talks about it and the patient had a normal e ejection fraction and something okay so as far as i know but it's been referred to as a heart of stone yeah, that's a really right. last example of it. I like that one. All right, this is a cool case that I think you will all like. This is um, a patient who was referred to our clinic for uh, pulmonary hypertension. And you'll see the central pulmonary arteries are quite large. Um, and there's some heterogeneity of the pulmonary vessels. And really not much else. There's a little something down in that right base and some something up in the liver. Um, and we were asked to look at the CT scan. Um, for the pulmonary hypertension, which we can see. And um, what we noticed is that there was um, a little web and a narrowing in the right lower lobe. And there are a couple other places like this. Um, right here, you see a segment just kind of drop out. So we were pretty suspicious there was a CTEF going on. But what's cool is, is if you keep going down, there's this funny artery coming off the, uh, looks like the superior mesenteric artery heads back up and goes into the right lower lobe. So there's also some systemic arterial supply, but wait, there's more. So now we look at the, whoops, wrong button. We look at the lung windows and we can see there's this lucent area of dis, uh, not necessarily disorganized lung, but sort of expanded lung with small vessels. And then this funny dilated airway that branches and kind of heads down there, but doesn't really arise from anything. And so this is a, another hybrid lesion. And if we look at the airway branching, we see there's the superior segment and you've got anterior and sort of a, seems like we're missing at least one segment or maybe subsegment from the right lower lobe, but already we're getting into abnormal lung. There's, these airways are getting a little big. So I think this is a, a bronchial atresia sequestration. Uh, on top of it, you'll see there's mosaic attenuation elsewhere uh, that in a patient with pulmonary hypertension, yeah, you can see subtle, subtle mosaicism. I do have a VQ scan. I was waiting on this one last week. And there's the VQ scan. And you can see um, all the little rat bites consistent with CTEF. Mm -hmm. So we can add that to our collection of congenital lesions. Um, let me show one more if I've got one. Let's see. I think that's it for now. I'll... Um, Travis, you said you had a few more? Sure. All right. Okay, this one. Pretty interesting. This is somewhat related to the mesothelioma case that Jeff showed. This is a patient who's middle-aged. He's a man who has HIV. He's 41 years old, so a little on the younger side. And he comes in with weight loss, uh, just some systemic symptoms, also has headache. And he gets the CT and you can see that there's, there's unilateral pleural thickening and it's nodular. And you can see there's nodularity anteriorly along the medial pleural surface. You can see nice discrete nodules here. Yes. And I think we probably all teach that nodular pleural thickening is cancer until proven otherwise. And I think that's, and in this case is not to dissuade anyone from saying that because I think in almost all cases it's going to be when you have that degree of nodularity. 
This turns out to be the one exception in this patient with HIV. So he has HIV AIDS. They tap the fluid. They actually did a PET scan expecting this to be uh, cancer. And anybody want to guess what it is? It is the AIDS-related, um, what's it called, pleural lymphoma. What is the word for that entity that they typically may get? Primary effusion lymphoma. Primary effusion lymphoma. Is that what it's called, it's David? Maybe David. Travis. Huh? Tuberculosis. Closer. Yeah, this turns out to be disseminated crypto. Oh. That this, yeah, that the, um, the, the, the pleural fluid actually grew crypto. He had crypto in his CSF as well. So he had disseminated cryptococcus. Uh, he had a headache. So, yeah, it fooled all of us. And this is, again, not to say that this should always be included, because I still think this is, I think, the only time that I can remember seeing one that was nodular to this degree that it didn't turn out to be cancer. But... He had a follow-up last month, both a chest and an abdomen and pelvis, and this is after treatment for his cryptococcus, and you can see that it's almost completely resolved. The effusion's gone. There's maybe a little bit stuff left there, but substantially decreased. So still should be cancer until proven otherwise, and in this case, it was proven otherwise <laughs> with nodular pleural thickening. So I thought I would throw that one out there just to, you know, just to keep us all on our toes every once in a while. And this is one that we've seen this diagnosis before. This is a patient who has, you know, this is the radiograph uh, pre-op, I think. They had had a CT before this, but it shows the same thing as the two CTs. So there's probably a small left effusion. And there's at least, you know, there's some volume loss on the left side. So there's, looks like there's maybe a mass here and some component of probably at least part left lower lobe atelectasis whether it's from an obstructing endobronchial lesion or, and or just passive atelectasis from the effusion. But you'll see she does have a left lower lobe cancer. This turned out to be an adenocarcinoma, and that's not the, you know, there's some obstruction of the basal or bronchi. So that's not the diagnostic dilemma in, that, in this case. This is one where, you know, I was, I was too afraid to put my money, you know, on it. But you can see there's tons and tons of tiny little nodules here. It are ill-defined ground glass, and maybe a couple little micro Cheerios in this case. Uh, wasn't we just kind of described it? I didn't come. I didn't say that I thought this was going to be minute meningothelial nodules because I didn't know if it would actually matter. She already had pleural disease in this case, but they ended up doing a a pneumonectomy, so they took out her whole left lung, and these did all turn out to be minute meningothelial nodules throughout the rest of the lung. So it's a path-proven case of it in addition to a large infarct that she had. Sure, sorry, a large cancer that she had. You know, it's interesting, Travis. I've, you know, I've, we come across them and I usually bury them in the report, but thinking about it, and I, I wonder if I'm just biased, but I seem to see them in patients with cancers, particularly lung adenocarcinomas. And maybe it's just because we're scanning a bunch of them. Yeah, I, the couple of, I've seen a couple of cases in patients that have breast cancer. I think we see them almost always in women, first of all. And I think it might just be an association or just a bias from association, but because we've seen them in other cancers as well. Um, but like, you know, and obviously like something that's this large and somebody that has an adenocarcinoma, I'm not going to call that a meningothelial like nodule, even though sometimes they can be over a centimeter. But some of the other ones were all little diffuse meningothelial nodules. So I don't, are you thinking they're somehow related if you see them in patients with, with lung cancer? Well, I just wonder if it, if it, if there's something about it that causes them to form, because we saw one in a patient we thought had METS. We saw one, I saw one the other day in a patient with a primary lung. So I don't know. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it's just a selection bias because we're CTing lots right. of cancer patients. Well, I think the other thing is that those are the people who get, who get um, their lungs removed and examined pathologically. So <clears throat> the question is what, you know, what percentage of people who don't have cancer um, would have these things if you if you uh, removed everybody's lungs and looked, yeah. uh, which would be cruel. Uh, does this person have emphysema? What are the what are the little holes? Or are the holes part of this meningothelial process? I think some of the little holes are part of the meningothelial nodules. Let's see. Uh, but that's a good question. They, it looks like they do have some paraseptal emphysema. So some of it may just be mild. Let's see. Maybe the path said. I guess they don't, they didn't really comment on it that much. Okay. 
yeah, but these were the, the other thing to say too that these nodules were unchanged over multiple scans. You know, whereas the the cancer was on treatment or whatever had been had been evolving. But yeah, I, I think it's probably a selection bias, but I don't know. I do think that we see them much more commonly in women. So you wonder if it's that is very related. true. Well, yeah. they they do have. They're typically, I think progesterone positive or estrogen and progesterone positive lesions, at least the cell surface receptors classically have, I think, progestin positive among other things. But that's just a curiosity. Yeah. Okay, really quick, this will take one minute. This is a patient, this is one of my residents showed this to me when he was on nuclear medicine a couple weeks ago. Bladder cancer, back in September, this guy's okay, in, in his chest at least, uh, paying attention to his mediastinum. Then he gets a PET CT before Christmas, and you'll see on his PET CT that he has a new unilateral effusion on the right, and he has some inflammatory stranding at the right anterior in his anterior mediastinal fat at the right cardiophrenic angle. Um, yes. And so he had actually he had had an episode of right-sided chest pain recently. Okay. So the, of course the, the fat stranding with the ipsilateral effusion and this one we actually have a PET correlate for it. <laughs> See, I got to sync the uh, the images here, but uh, it was you know this area was slightly more metabolically active, but it's going to end up being obviously just an it's right there. There's a little I don't have it registered correctly, but yeah. So anterior mediastinal fat necrosis or epipericardial fat necrosis, whatever you want to call it. There was a a nice educational exhibit at RSNA this year out of Pitt where they had a I don't know like 35 cases or something that they reviewed. And the one observation we've made, they found in about 75% of all their cases, which was the ipsilateral pleural effusion with the mediastinal fat necrosis. Cool. So I know that's something we've discussed. And so they, in their data, it was around three quarters of patients had that. So, oh. Is the thought still that it's a strangulated epiploic uh, fat lobule? Don't know, just idiopathic spontaneous necrosis. well the discussion the case yeah. that howard was it you that showed that fat globule a couple of weeks ago that was just right. kind of hanging hanging down in the setting of the pneumothorax or someone showed oh, it. Oh, that. Oh. yeah that was that was different that was uh extra pleural fat right uh, well but you wonder if these if it's on a pet if it's on a pedicle and it torses or if it's just that there's some other mechanism of spontaneous necrosis but hmm, i don't know but that's such a typical location, lower yeah. chest, yep. paracardiac, left or right. Yep. Hmm, interesting. Uh, this, and now we have a PET CT of it. <laughs> All so, right, guys. Well, thank you. Uh,